Tonight's program is part of a series of informal lectures sponsored by the Friends of Alexandria Archaeology. Each program that we do relates to the rich archaeological heritage of Alexandria and to the surrounding area. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tom Nasha. He's the Vice President of the Friends of Alexandria Archaeology, and he will be introducing tonight's speaker. Thanks, Emma. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Benjamin Skolnick. Ben is an archeologist for the city of Alexandria. He specializes in landscape archeology, span digital mapping and GIS. He earned his bachelor's, bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary and his doctorate from the University of Maryland. Before coming to Alexandria Archeology span in, in 2015, he was the associate director and lab manager of archeology span of Annapolis. So I gotta say, Ben, you've got two very great venues to work in over, over your career. I know everybody's eager to hear from Ben about his latest research on the Schooner Enterprise. So without further introduction, I'll hand it over to Ben. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in December, 2015, some of you might remember um, archeologists from Thunderbird Archeology span encountered the remains of an 18th or early 19th century wooden ship hall at the site of what's now Hotel Indigo at 220 South Union Street. Uh, in the spring of 2017, three more wooden ships were discovered across Duke Street from that site at the former site of Robinson Terminal South. Um, and these ships, they, they're, um, they're essentially uh, anonymous artifacts. We don't know the names of the ships. We don't know who owned them. Uh, we don't know where they sailed. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back dendrochronology dates on the ship hull. And so there's a lot we don't know about these ships. Uh, and so one of the challenges as an archaeologist is to be able to talk about the things that we dig up uh, when we do encounter silent, uh, anonymous fragments of the past in the ground. Um, and so this talk is not about those ships. Uh, it's about, let's see, it's about this ship. Uh, the Schooner Enterprise. Um, the Schooner Enterprise sailed during the first decade of the 19th century. Uh, it was based here in Alexandria and owned by uh, two or three merchants in town. And the reason we're going to talk about the Schooner Enterprise is because we have a logbook from the schooner, uh, the dates to 1803 and 1804. And so uh, I turn to the Schooner Enterprise as a proxy for, um, for our ships. Uh, we don't know a lot of the historic details behind the fragments of our ship hulls, um, but from documents like this logbook, from uh, newspaper accounts, from customs records, and from a couple other sources that are out there, we can piece together a fairly rich picture of the schooner enterprise. And then we can use this ship um, as a proxy, as a, as a stand-in to help us talk about the kinds of things our ships would have been carrying, the places they would have gone, um, what it was like to be on them, the pieces, the parts, all of the, the nitty gritty history bits that, that archaeology uh, sometimes is, it's hard to get at with archaeology. Um, but by pulling in these other sources, um, it's, um, uh, it paints a, a much broader, more, more detailed picture for us. Um, so here's, here's a, a representative page of what this logbook looks like. Um, you've got daily entries. Um, every two hours, there's, there's an entry to describe weather, winds, um, the currents, uh, stuff happening on the boat, where the boat is, or, or maybe more accurately, where they think they are. Um, you have damaged some of the pages. Some pages are out of order. Some are completely missing. Um, this page I like to show. Um, uh, sort of in this condition, especially because it, it reminds us that this is actually a, um, the copy we have was uh, microfilmed from the original, and it adds an entire layer of sort of archival research on top of the historic document, um, just to, to help us remember that this thing is, uh, it's, it's in a library somebody, somewhere else, and so this is the copy we're working from, sort of one step removed from, from that original. Um, the logbook covers four separate voyages the Schooner Enterprise takes in 1803 and 1804, um, three down to the Caribbean and one all the way across the Atlantic to Spain, France, and England uh, before turning around and coming back home. 
Um, the reason the logbook exists in the first place or still exists in the first place uh, is that it was entered as evidence in a court case. Um, it, the descriptive name of the Schooner Enterprise and her tackle, excuse me, uh, William Lewis, late master of the Schooner Enterprise against the Schooner Enterprise for tackle furniture and apparel and against Ebenezer Everest, master of the said Schooner Enterprise. Um, and I think that says, uh, what's that other part say? So it's the end of the sentence. Um, and so um, from that mouthful of a court case, uh, we have this primary source document that, that gives us a, a rich understanding of um, just daily life on board this ship. And so this document is, is uh, it's the only piece of evidence that's been turned up so far to sort of describe um, the background to the, to the court case. And, all we can say is that the case um, is a libel and admiralty suit. Um, and so my understanding of early 19th century admiralty courts, if, if that's a, an academic profession that people still, still study, um, is not libel in the sense that we understand it today in uh, a, um, sort of a, um, a false or harmful written statement that you can sue somebody for making. Um, but it's, it's a sort of a debt that was incurred against the financial interest of either the ship or the owners of the ship. Uh, we know William Lewis was the, uh, the mate on board the Enterprise. Um, and so something happened where William Lewis incurred a debt. Uh, he had to pay something or he was injured in some way. Uh, and he's trying to recoup those losses against the ship or his employer, uh, the owners of the ship. Um, Ultimately, the judge finds against the enterprise and for William Lewis and awards him the grand sum of $132.74 uh, plus 6% interest and court costs. And that's all we know about this court case. Uh, it doesn't go any more into the original, um, whatever the, the injury, either physical or um, uh, uh, metaphorical injury that, that William Lewis suffers um, against either him or his financial interests. Um, but we know that uh, along with this court case was entered into the evidence, the logbook. And so uh, nowhere in the logbook is the sum of $132.74 uh, entered. And nowhere does William Lewis scrawl in the, in the margins, um, these jerks owe me money for such and such a reason. Uh, and so we're sort of left scratching our heads about what exactly happened. Uh, and ultimately, you know, from it's probably, it's probably not a, um, a terribly relevant question. Uh, and what's much more important uh, from a scholarly, scholarly perspective is that we have the logbook in the first place. Uh, and so before I move on, I need to, to emphasize, and I can't emphasize this enough, um, that you know, it's one thing to have um, a 19th century, an early 19th century logbook uh, with all of this rich detail in it. Um, but there's, there's seven or eight steps that have to happen before you can do anything useful uh, with this logbook, before you can get up and give a lecture like this with this logbook. And so I have to acknowledge the efforts of an Alexandria archaeology volunteer, Adam Parker, who sat down and transcribed the logbook for us, including um, not just the, the, um, the text in it, but also formatting it for the, um, the hours, uh, each hourly observation, um, the course headings and their observed latitude. Um, and then from that, the other piece that I need to acknowledge is that Adam was able to uh, take their observed latitudes um, and combine that with the weather and the, um, their reckoning of how far they've gone, their dead reckoning. And he was able to plot these four voyages of the enterprise um, in GIS for me. And then from that, we're able to plot that on, on a modern map or any historic map that uh, is from the period that we want to. And we're able to view and, and sort of examine where they went and what they're doing. And, and um, uh, ultimately we're able to hold up entries from the logbook against these geographic coordinates. And so I need to acknowledge that Adam put this together and is ultimately responsible for, for turning this logbook into a document that um, we can use and we can talk about. Uh, and so probably one more piece of housekeeping is that you probably have already noticed if you're if you've got sharp eyes, um, but enterprise is spelled <laughs> at least two different ways um, throughout this presentation because 
uh, enterprise is spelled two different ways throughout the historic record, uh, sometimes even two different ways on the same document. And so you'll see enterprise spelled with an S at the end, uh, or sometimes with a Z. And I, I, I don't know that I have a preference for which one. I, I lean towards the S um, as it's the more prevalent of the two spellings, but uh, it's one of those, those uh, just the way 19th century English works sometimes. Uh, and so um, to talk about the schooner enterprise, I think maybe it's important to, to show you what it is we're talking about. What's a schooner? Um, and so when I get presented with questions like this, uh, as often as I can, I like to go back to the original source um, material. And so I pulled off the shelf, uh, the, the digital computer shelf, um, this maritime dictionary uh, um, from the 18th century. And I flipped it open to the S section and I found myself the definition of a schooner. And so a schooner is a small vessel with two masts whose mainsail and foresail are suspended from gaffs, reaching from the mast toward the stern and stretched out below by booms whose foremost ends are hooked to an iron which clasps to the mast so as to turn therein upon an axis where when the after ends are swung from one side of the vessel to another. Oof, it's a mouthful. And so I'm sure you all from reading this have in your mind exactly what a schooner is and we can move on from there. Um, or I can show you from another period uh, source. This is um, a fairly famous um, treatise on naval architecture. Uh, and it shows us um, on, a, on a very large um, uh, engraving, uh, a whole bunch of different ships. And I'll show the rest of them here in a second. Uh, but this is number six, the schooner. And so you can see it's a smallish vessel that's got two masts, uh, four mast and your main mast. And the, the important piece about a schooner is that this, the main sails on those two masts, uh, that's this one here, the foresail, and this one here, the main sail, are suspended from gaffs, this sort of diagonal um, uh, spar piece of wood up here. Uh, and then down below, they're also fastened on these, which are hooked onto the masts um, with, uh, but what do they say? Uh, clasps to the mast hooked with an iron. Uh, so, so down here, and then they pivot from the from the mast um, uh, and as the ship needs to, to catch the wind to sail. Uh, and that's probably the, the, the major distinction between a schooner and some of the other kinds of ships that are out there, um, which are rigged with um, sort of those um, square sails. If you look behind me here, these are ships uh, with square sails on their, on their masts. And so in the 18th and 19th century, uh, certainly up until the advent of, um, of the steamship, um, that's sort of the, the main classification uh, behind ships. Um, and um, so while I've got this picture of the schooner up, let me share with you this. Uh, we'll sort of go to the birth of our schooner enterprise. Um, I actually came across this while working on a different project, um, which I'll wrap up this talk talking about. Um, but I was able to find um, a record of our schooner enterprise, um, which we knew, and I'll get to this in a second, was built up in Connecticut. Uh, and the schooner enterprise was built in 1801. Uh, it's 89 tons, um, which is a, a fancy measurement to get a sort of an estimate for how much it can carry. Uh, 62 feet long, 20 feet wide, eight feet deep, one deck, two masts, uh, no figurehead on the front. And then it's got a short chain of title starting from uh, as the ship sort of um, sailed out of Glastonbury, Connecticut, down the Connecticut River and into uh, New York City. Um, and then through to um, when it gets picked up by Alexandrian merchants. And so um, I, when I came across this, I wasn't even, I wasn't thinking enterprise because I was working on something else, but um, it's always nice to sort of make these kind of connections you know, uh, when you're working on these, these projects. Uh, and so we've got this record uh, sourced from early 19th century um, uh, ship registration um, uh, data. Uh, and so here's the rest of that, that plate. Um, other common um, ship types that were common in, in Alexandria in the early 19th century include uh, number one here. Uh, this is a, a fully rigged ship. Um, if you open up your Naval Dictionary again and you open up to the entry for ship, there's actually two definitions of ship. The first is a three-masted vessel whose primary sails are um, square rigged like this. Uh, and then um, it, it makes me happy to read the second definition of a ship, 
which goes something along the lines of uh, ships also a word for people that people use uh, people who aren't versed in ships and don't know what they're talking about to describe any of these things that you see in front of you. Uh, and it, the, the definition concludes by saying, um, you know, technically, the first thing is a ship, but um, you know, we'll let them say ship if they want to. And so sometimes you'll hear me s slip up and call our schooner a ship. Uh, and I don't feel so bad because the 18th century naval dictionary says I can. Um, the other common ships in Alexandria, um, number two here is called a snow, two masts, uh, and what's, uh, excuse me, it's actually three masts. There, there's a sort of a third small snow mast that this gas tail is attached to on the back, um, and I'll show you a better picture of that in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, number four is a brig. It just has two masts, uh, and this gas sail is attached to the, the main sail, or excuse me, the main mast here. Uh, and then sloops, number 12 down here, just one mast, uh, but it's gaff rigged like a schooner is. Um, so uh, our schooner enterprise rolls off the um, the shipyard, say rolls off, it slides into the Connecticut River, I guess, um, sometime in 1801. Uh, and um, as near as I can tell, our schooner enterprise is named after this schooner enterprise. Um, the schooner enterprise is this one right here. Uh, which is a United States schooner. It's a, it's a naval vessel. It's in the United States Navy, which in the early, the, the first years of the 19th century is uh, sailing around the Mediterranean and the coast of Africa fighting, um, fighting pirates um, of all things. And so um, on August 1st, 1801, the schooner Enterprise, the uh, United States schooner Enterprise, um, fought um, against this vessel here, a Corsair from Tripoli named appropriately, I guess, the Tripoli. Um, and it, um, it defeated the Tripoli. Um, I'm sure the claims are exaggerated slightly, but it, it, uh, the records say it didn't suffer a scratch and it sent the boat back to the, to the harbor. And all the other sailors saw the Tripoli come into the harbor and nobody wanted to go back out into the water after that. And that's the news that we got back to um, to Alexandria uh, sometime around November of 1801. And then probably around December, the beginning of December, uh, we know that our um, enterprise um, uh, makes its way down to New York from the Connecticut River. And so my best guess is that news of this naval victory is getting back to the United States right around the same time that this ship is rolling out of the shipyard. Um, and um, that's why they call it the Schooner Enterprise. And now it doesn't make it easy to research our Schooner Enterprise because um, there's at least three or four other Schooner Enterprises running around uh, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean uh, at the same time. Um, and it makes it a little bit difficult to sort out which one is which. Um, you know, it's, uh, sometimes when you, you're reading the news accounts, if there's uh, an account of a, a fantastic naval battle or gallantry, um, the odds are it's not our enterprise because our enterprise isn't fighting pirates. Um, and so Alexandria, this map is from 1804. Uh, it shows Alexandria sort of um, as, a, as a small but growing um, maritime city. Um, on the right hand side of the sort of the pink part that represents the city, you can see all of the, the uh, city wharves. Um, that our enterprise would have docked um, and sort of berthed at. Uh, and so the important piece for this, this talk here is to, to remember that sort of this sort of centermost, waterfront most part of the city of Alexandria uh, didn't exist 50 years before this map was drawn. Um, it was, as George Washington draws it in sort of the, the famous early map of Alexandria, a shallow crescent shaped bay. Um, it's a few feet deep at, at high tide uh, and it's shallow mud flats. And so there's this incentive on um, the part of early Alexandrian waterfront property owners to fill in their, their waterfront, to expand the city, to grow, grow to, to create new land for themselves um, on the waterfront, uh, to, to extend sort of their piers out into that deep shipping channel, which comes real close to the shore here. Uh, and so what you end up with is, um, a city built on top of uh, filled in mud flats. And so a lot of that is uh, sand and clay and rocks and dirt. 
Um, but also part of that are derelict ships. Uh, so over the last, I guess it's five or five and a half years now, um, redevelopment along the waterfront has come down on the remains of at least four of these ships, um, sort of in the centermost part. Uh, they've been cleaned off, documented in the ground, uh, dismantled, um, and stored, uh, transported and stored off site uh, for future documentation and conservation work. Um, so this is down at the foot of Duke Street. One of these ships is found just to the north uh, under what's now Hotel Indigo at 220 South Union Street. Uh, and then three more are found to the south of Duke Street. Um, it's what's now Robinson Landing was then Robinson Terminal South, the old Washington Post um, newsprint warehouse. Um, so yeah, um, this is that first ship. This is Hotel Indigo. Um, it was founded in December of 2015. And so I like this photo for a couple of reasons, but, but probably, probably most of all is because you can see where the ship is and you can see where the river is. And you can see that there's that much land in between the, the boat, the ship and the water. And so you're sort of left asking yourself, how did the ship get out of the water? And the answer is that the ship used to be in the water and that Alexandrians have added that much land to the city since the time that you know, this ceased to be a ship and became, uh, became literally landfill. Um, you know, my brother makes fun of me that I studied trash boats um, and, and he's meaning not the sense that uh, they carry trash, but they're garbage. They, somebody chopped them up and didn't need them anymore and got rid of them the easiest way they could, which was to sink them and then put new land on top of it. Uh, and so here's your crash course in naval architecture. Um, all of our ships, they, they all seem to date from roughly the same time period, late 18th, early 19th century. You know, one of them um, might, might have been buried as late as the 1830s or 1840s based on some, some where it was found in some of the maps that we have. Um, but they all seem to go on the ground roughly during the end of the 18th and into the early 19th century. Uh, which is the known period of land building here in Alexandria. So it's, it's kind of convenient when the style, the, the, um, the naval architecture of the ship matches when we think these things went on the ground based on when that ground was created. Uh, and so they all sort of share the same characteristics. Um, sort of, if you think about a ship, thinking about standing down in the hull of the ship at the bottom of it, um, you know, they all sort of have uh, uh, these these planking here. This is called ceiling planking. That's the part you're walking on. That's the part you're putting uh, hogsheads of tobacco or sugar or rum or um, whatever it is you're carrying in your ship. That's sort of the what you think of as the, the interior of the bottom. Um, I don't know why they call this the bottom of the ship the ceiling when the ceiling is usually the thing above our heads, but that's what they call it. Um, directly underneath of that, you have your frames. And your frames are these, um, if you think of a ship like a human body, they're going to be your ribs. Uh, and there's a couple different kinds of frames, depending on where in the ship um, they're found, sort of where up that ship's profile they are. Um, starting sort of at the midline, at the keel, um, the center, the, the uh, frames that uh, span the center of the keel are called floors. Uh, and then um, if you think about how to take wood, which used to be a tree, which generally trees grow pretty straight, and then turn that into a, a curve that forms the, the profile of the ship. Um, you can either go and, and chop down a tree and bend this large trunk 90 degrees into a U shape, or what's easier, um, and what they did, is to take smaller pieces, bend each one a little bit, uh, carve it out as best you can, uh, and then cobble together two or three or four or five or six, however many pieces you need to get up and build the curve in the side of your ship. Um, and so once you get off uh, from the floor, that centerpiece, the first piece off to the side is called, the, they're all called futtics. This is called the first futtic. Um, the one next to it here is called the second futtic. And then the, as you sort of build the, the curve of your hull, you get third, fourth, and I think um, the largest ship we have may even have a, a piece of a fifth buttock uh, here or there. Uh, and so you sort of just build um, small curved pieces as you go up the side. Um, those are all held together with these wooden pegs uh, called trunnels or tr literally tree nails. Uh, 
these are useful for a couple reasons. They're cheaper than metal. Um, they bend and flex. Um, when you get them wet, they swell. Um, and so they uh, form a tighter uh, seal or a bond between your pieces. Um, and uh, they, won't, they won't rust and snap and break like metal fasteners will. Um, on the outside of your frames, you attach hole planking with these trunnels. Uh, and the hole planking is, runs sort of perpendicular to, um, uh, to your buttocks, to your frames. Um, and you form long, long runs with them as you sort of go long ways down the ship. Um, on the outside of that, you slap on a coat of uh, what's called oakum or plock. And it's basically tar or pitch mixed with horse hair or rope fiber. Um, and the idea is to waterproof your ship and to uh, keep out um, shipworms or anything else that lives um, in, the, in the water, especially the tropical waters of the Caribbean that uh, eat and feed on um, driftwood. And so they, um, if you let them, will chew through and eat up your, um, your ship. Um, and then on the outside of all of that, it's not great from um, hydro, a hydrodynamic point of view to have horsehair and pitch on the outside of your ship. Uh, not to mention moving through the water, it'll peel it right off. And so the outside of all of that, you nail on um, what's called sacrificial planking. And it's this real cheap, real thin um, uh, additional set of planking um, that you understand that after a while, it's gonna get banged up, things are gonna eat into it. And then after a while, you just strip it off, put on some new stuff and your ship is good to go. Um, so when we found these things, um, these ships um, as archeologists, you know, archeology span is inherently a destructive act. When you dig, you literally destroy that context, the dirt, the, the rocks, the artifacts, and then the relationships between them, as you take it out of the ground, you destroy that, you lose it. And so the idea is in order to make this a worthwhile activity so that um, somebody who comes after me can figure out what it is that I did, you have to document what you did. And so um, uh, these ships, we approach them with a mix of um, digital and sort of old fashioned analog documentation techniques, uh, ranging from, um, uh, sort of traditional plan views in the field, sort of straight down drawing what's there. Um, we did a round of another round of drawing each individual uh, timber as it as it was disassembled, um, and we also did a round of uh, digital documentation both in the field um, here with what's called photogrammetry. It's um, a digital technique that sort of works on the same principle as sort of. Uh, as those view masters you may have had when you were a kid, um, those, those orange goggles with the discs and you look in and it gives you a 3D view. Uh, and you sort of do that with hundreds of photographs and it can construct a three-dimensional model for you. Uh, and we also did it with a, um, a laser scanner. Uh, and I, I forget how many points um, went into each of these scans, but basically every time one of these layers of the ship came off, scan it again and now um, we have this uh, digital record of what the ship looked like in the ground uh, still fully assembled. Uh, because they were building uh, hotels and apartments and condos and uh, retail at these sites um, complete with underground parking the ships couldn't stay there and so we had to take them apart and move them off site. Uh, and then once they were sort of off site and we weren't under the timetable of, uh, of the backhoe, we had more time to sort of relax and, and document these things. Um, here, uh, the timbers from Hotel Indigo are being documented uh, down at Texas A&M. And they're able to scan each individual timber, load them into a sort of a virtual 3D space, and then sort of correct for all of the damage and warping and crushing and um, displacements that's happened to these timbers over the last 200 or so years. And they're able to reconstruct a digital 3D model, not just of the individual timber, but they're able to take each timber and put the ship back together in virtual space. And then the exciting piece is from that, uh, we have a model maker who built for us the model of the Hotel Indigo ship and is currently working on the three other models for the Robinson Terminal South ships. And so uh, in our museum today, you can go and visit um, uh, this model here, which to the best of our knowledge is sort of the first um, uh, 3D printed uh, archeologically recovered 
model mixed in with sort of the conjectural plan uh, and ship lines um, from what we think the rest of the ship looked like. And so you can really see what my brother is getting at when he calls this thing a trash ship. Um, you know, we, we don't have the whole ship. We've got, we've got the, the front of a side of the bottom of this thing. And so, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a task to try to, to extrapolate from this into what is this ship doing? Um, coming up here are the three other ships that were under the former site of Robinson Terminal South. This is the aptly named Robinson Terminal South ship number one because it was the first ship found. Uh, it's also the smallest of the three ships. Um, you can see that this one doesn't have uh, ceiling planking, but you could see the, uh, the frames, the futtocks, um, the keel. Um, and it has a piece called the keel sin, which sort of sits on top of the keel and sort of sandwiches the whole thing together. Uh, and one of the neat things about ship number one is that it was actually um, pinned underneath of uh, the later flour mill that, was, that they built on top of the site, on top of the land that um, this ship was used to fill in. And you can see the, the um, I'm forgetting now if this is the bow or the stern. I think it's the stern. No, bow, this is the bow. Uh, and you can see the, the wharf here um, uh, smashed on top of, resting on top of the, the ship. Uh, this is the aptly named Robinson Terminal South ship number two. Uh, it's probably comparable in size to the Hotel Indigo ship dug out from across the street. This is uh, a picture of the now built Hotel Indigo. Uh, and um, very similar thing. Uh, this one was also missing ceiling planking, but you can see the frames, the keelson. Uh, once you take it apart, you get down to the keel and the hull planking. Uh, and then I told you a minute ago, I'd show you evidence of a snow. And if you look at the keelson here, there's actually two pockets um, sort of cut into the keelson um, that were probably used as mast steps. Um, you'd sit the mast down in there. And the, the actual uh, naval historians I've talked to, um, the only reason they could think of to, for why there would be two mast steps placed so close together is because um, you needed a place to put this, this third uh, small uh, snow mast. Uh, ship two is also sort of sandwiched underneath of these um, wharf bulkheads. And you can see that they're, they're reusing sort of these, um, what used to be ships, um, sort of as a, a, a last use of them in order to, uh, well, as a, as a pre-made bulkhead is what they're, they're using them for in order to uh, hold in, uh, hold back sort of the, the soil and dirt and clay and sand they're, they're filling in the river with. Uh, and this is the aptly named Robinson Terminal South ship number three. It is by far the largest of these four ships. Um, you can see that part of it goes underneath of uh, Wolf Street here. Um, this um, poured cement slurry wall um, sort of cuts the ship, maybe not in half, but 60, 40. Um, the part inside the, it's now a parking garage, uh, was taken apart and recovered. And the part on the other side of the wall uh, is still underneath of Wolf Street. Uh, so let's talk, let's talk voyages of the Schooner Enterprise. Uh, it went on four voyages between 1803 and 1804. Um, we know of a couple of voyages it took sort of outside that time frame, but we don't have, um, we don't have a log for it. Uh, the first voyage in the log book starts January 31st, 1803 and goes until May 25th, 1803. Um, and so before we jump into sort of the, the nuts and bolts of this voyage, let's talk about how this log book works. Uh, each box represents uh, one day in the, in the enterprise here. Uh, down the side here, you've got your, uh, you're keeping track of time every two hours. Uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And so every two hours you would record um, uh, how fast you were going in knots and half knots. You would write down the course, which way your ship was pointing. You would note down uh, in the next column where the wind was blowing. And then you would have a big box for, um, for your remarks. Anything notable that happened, uh, this is where they write down what sails they're putting in, uh, pulling in what sails are setting. Uh, this is where they're writing, um, you know, if they're pumping water all day, if there's a storm, any other ships they see, any ports they arrive at, um, anything noteworthy worthy that goes into a ship log goes in that box. Uh, at the end of the day, they sort of figure out based on uh, 
how fast they've been going in which direction, how many miles they've traveled. Uh, distance uh, here, it says 81. I can't quite see what this says, uh, but it tells you how many miles they made that day. And then at noontime, they reckon what their latitude is. They, um, using, I, I assume using a sextant um, uh, or some similar device, uh, figure out where they are uh, on the surface of the earth in terms of degrees above, I guess this is all exclusively above the equator. Uh, and so um, recorded in this format is everything important that the ship's captain or the sailing master um, thought they needed to record in, in the ship log. Uh, so the ship clears the port of Alexandria um, uh, oh, right. uh, in er, mid-January. Um, the logbook, for some reason, doesn't start until January 31st. Um, so they, they sort of exclude leaving the Chesapeake, leaving the Potomac, um, sailing down past Florida, and the logbook actually picks up uh, outside Barbados. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that the, that the logbook can help us get at is you know, some, of the, some of the stuff that doesn't survive archaeologically. Um, we can use this logbook to figure out the rigging plan of the ship, that is, um, what, what sails it had, um, you know, what it looked like from the sort of the deck up. Um, we know because it's a schooner, it's got two masts, and because it's a schooner, we know what kind of sails are on those two masts, at least the, the two main sails. Um, these trapezoidal gaff rig sails here. Uh, but schooners come in a couple different uh, varieties or flavors. Uh, top sail schooners, which have um, sort of these square sails set up on top of the mast. Uh, fore and aft schooners, which have additional uh, gaff rig sails or these triangular sails um, up here. Uh, and going through the logbook, we can make a list of all of the kinds of sails uh, that the, the the captain or the, the mate is um, noting in the logbook is you know, they are being set or pulled in or something's wrong with them and they have to fix them. Uh, and so of all the sails that we have, what get mentioned are the main sail, the fore sail, the main top sail, the fore top sail, the main top gallant sail, the fore top gallant sail, the jib, the fore jib, the flying jib, and maybe the steering sail. Um, it's not quite clear if that's a separate sail. I've, I've sort of run out of room to put sails on this ship. Um, or if it's they're, they're just using steering sail as a descriptor for how they're using one of these other sails. Uh, and so when you put them on a sail plan, um, uh, these are sort of modern uh, schooners, um, just to give you sort of a, a picture in your head of what a, the schooner enterprise would have looked like. Uh, this is sort of the sail plan. Um, all the sails on the foremast get sort of this four prefix. All the sails on the main sail get on the main mast get the main, this main prefix. Uh, and then sort of depending on how high up you are, they get a different name, um, uh, four sail or main sail or the top or the top gallant. And as you get into the 19th century, you start to get larger and larger ships with more and more masts uh, and more and more sails. And I haven't had to, to dive into it, but it, it gets kind of silly after a while, the number of different sail names each individual sail has based on which mast it's on and how high up it is. Um, so um, in early February, fe February 2nd, they, uh, you know, they set some of the, the, they make a note that they set the four top gallant sail. Later on, there's a note that they set the square sail and, and sort of so on and so on. Um, on February 10th, on sort of the, as they're, they're down there around Barbados, um, they note that there's a short jump of a seam. And what they're telling us is that a gap has opened up um, somewhere on their hull planking and water's coming in. Uh, and so the solution is to uh, either nail it back in place or stuff something in the crack until you can sort of pull into port and, um, and fix that up. Uh, we also know that the schooner Enterprise carried with it a small boat. Uh, this probably isn't exactly like the, the, the small boat um, that the Enterprise would have carried, uh, but this was excavated uh, archaeologically here in Alexandria down from underneath of um, uh, Ford's Landing back in the 80s. Uh, this is just a small ship known as a bateau. And so once the, the Enterprise sails into port uh, and arrives and they're um, uh, pulled up to a wharf, um, they're dealing with cargo, they're offloading cargo, they're pulling on new cargo, they're resupplying. Uh, 
Uh, they're repairing the ship in ways that they couldn't do while at sea. The format of the ship's log changes because now all of a sudden uh, you don't need to record um, where you are every two hours, how fast you're going, which direction you're, you're pointing in. Uh, it's, it's not as important anymore because you know where you are. You're not going to get lost. You don't have to figure how many miles you've traveled that day. Um, you're in port. You know where you are. Um, so um, after the Enterprise arrives in port the first time, uh, they're down here off um, in St. John's. Uh, the logbook tells us that Mr. Nichols, the, the, the mate on the ship, was on shore trying to, um, quote, seal the cargo. And I'm, I'm pretty sure what seal means is he's trying to sell the cargo. Um, sort of all throughout the, this logbook, you see sort of these misspellings that when you say how it's spelled, it sounds right. And so um, they're trying to sell the cargo. And one of the things that uh, is apparent from reading the logbook is that um, the way that you would go about trying to um, uh, you go about this whole process is you would sail from island to island. You would take in news and rumors uh, where you could, and you would sort of uh, do your best to guess what kind of profit you can make with what you had in your cargo hold at that port versus you know, what's rumored, what's the price of grain or corn, you know, the next island over. And you would sail from island to island, selling what you think you could get a good profit on, buying what you think that, that island would have that you couldn't get a better price somewhere else. And you would sort of sail until you uh, ran out of whatever you had when you left uh, Alexandria. You would fill up with things like, uh, the logbook tells us they're buying uh, sugar, rum, brandy, and wine. Um, you know, also tells us that they're mostly, they mostly have flour on board, but also there's pork, beef, bread, and beans. Um, and so you're sort of exchanging what Alexandria has for what they have down in the Caribbean. And then when you, when you've accomplished that, uh, at the highest profit margin you think you can get, uh, you turn around and you come back to Alexandria to unload your cargo. Uh, one of the things that we're told Mr. Nichols delivers, uh, to the island is um, 30 barrels of ship's bread. And ship's bread is just a, a, a nice name for, I think what we understand as hardtack. Um, it's, it's sort of sea stable, it's dense, it's hard. Um, it'll last for as long as you're out. Um, we know that there's bakeries in town baking this stuff um, specifically for the ships coming in and out of port. And archeologically, we've actually recovered a piece of ship's bread. Um, and so this is it's probably not too far from the consistency of, of when this thing went into the ground. Um, uh, but this is an archaeological example from the Robinson Terminal South site. Um, we know that there's uh, different sizes of barrels. Um, the Enterprise has in its hold hogsheads, barrels, puncheons, kegs, and firkins. Um, uh, these are just some sort of... Um, uh, fairly standardized for at least 18th and 19th century standards, um, barrel sizes. And so you can see that um, you can sort of put together in your head a picture of what's in the, the hull of the, the schooner Enterprise. Um, on their way back on uh, May 19th, 1803, um, they see this thing. Um, this is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. Um, this is actually a Civil War drawing at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, so you'll have to imagine for a second that this darker section hasn't been built yet, and that they're just looking at this short, squat little thing that uh, was eventually replaced by the current Cape Hatteras Lighthouse um, in 1870. Uh, and after they pass the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, um, the next day they pass Cape Henry, uh, and they see the original Cape Henry Lighthouse. Um, uh, they say at four, pass the lighthouse, this one. Uh, and shipped a course up the bay. Uh, and then finally, May 25th, uh, they returned back to Alexandria. Uh, they dock at a wharf, um, and the, the voyage isn't, uh, they've arrived in Alexandria, but the work's not done. There's people still employed in clearing out the schooner's deck. They have to get the cargo out. Um, they hire people in town to move the cargo out of the, out of the enterprise uh, and fix up some of the stuff that they, that, um, you know, uh, hull panel or planking that came loose, um, uh, taking on new sails um, before they can turn around and go back out to sea. Uh, voyage two, uh, this one, they leave um, 
uh, the, the, the logbook picks up uh, June 3rd, somewhere off the Carolinas. They don't bother to record the trip down the Potomac or the Chesapeake again. Uh, this trip, if you look at the map, is a little bit different than the previous one in that instead of coasting from island to island, from port to port, they've got a specific, um, a specific destination in mind, uh, Port Francois or Port Francis, uh, I guess if you're an American, uh, down on what's now Haiti. Um, and so they go straight there and back. And it, as, uh, as near as I can tell, um, Haiti is sort of at the, the final stages of the Haitian revolution at this point. Uh, France has tried to come back in and take control over the island. Uh, it's not going great for them. Most of their soldiers and sailors are dying of yellow fever in 1803. Uh, and so they're sort of clinging to a couple of these coastal ports. Um, and by the time the summer rolls around, the British have blockaded the island. They're not letting the French in or out of these ports. Uh, and so my, my best guess is that because of the British blockade, um, there's a premium on the kind of foodstuffs, for example, that's coming out of Alexandria. Uh, and so that's why the owners of the enterprise loaded up with, with flour uh, and headed down and to try to land in Port Francis. Um, one of the things that happens on this voyage is we have a new author. The handwriting is, is quite different. And if you read through it, they're also making very different kinds of the observations on the trip. Um, they're making points to record when new casks of food or water are being opened. They're very clear, much clearer than the first author about which sails are being set and when. And especially they make a note when, a note when the ship has to get pumped. And so when you're out at sea, it's expected that water is going to find its way into your ship. Uh, either through the hull planking or sort of down through the deck. And so if you don't want to sink, you have to send somebody down there to pump it all out. And so what's cool about Mrs. Robinson Terminal South ship number two is that down here at the very bottom of the ship, we've got what looks like a, um, a well or a hole for a pump. Uh, underneath each of our frames, this is sort of a cross section of them, or one of the digital scans. Um, on either side of the keel, you've got these two grooves cut into the bottom of the plank of the of the frame. And these are called limber holes. And basically what they do is they give you a channel that run lengthwise down the ship through which water can collect and then move sort of to the lowest point. Uh, and then when the water that's in the bottom of your ship gets to there, uh, you can pump it out. And so archaeologically from these sites, we don't have a pump associated with these ships. Uh, but we have found pumps elsewhere in the city. These are sort of the, the wells or the, the hydrants, they're called, um, that at one point were throughout the city and provided public water. And the, the principles are the same. You sort of have um, this log with a hole in the center of it. And when you pump on the handle, it pulls up the, a piece of wood in the center, draws water up into the center of the pump, and then out through another hole. And so that's how you keep your ship afloat while you're out at sea. Um, and then the other thing that this author tells us much more than the, the previous one is all of the maintenance that went into just the, the daily maintenance on the ship. Um, he tells us that there's various scraping and cleaning of the boat. People are employed in tarring down the rigging and blacking the yards and mastheads. They're scraping under the vessel. There's painting. They're scraping and painting. There's repairing the, the sails. Um, he tells us there's various scraping and cleaning the boat. Uh, fitting new futtock heads, scrubbing the bottom, repairing the sails, filling water casks, and this is a very helpful and descriptive phrase, other jobs most useful. Um, he tells us they're scraping the deck, painting the schooner, painting the schooner uh, careening the ship, which is what you see here. You sort of um, uh, weight it down and tip it over on the side so you can um, scrape and clean the bottom of it. Uh, scrape down the mast, scraping and scrubbing the bottom, uh, because it being very foul is what he tells us. Uh, and so, um, you know, reading between the lines here, between the importance of the food and writing down all of the pumping and hard work that's going on, if I had to guess, my guess is the person who has to write this log entry is not the person telling everybody to do this, but it's, it's somebody who has to go and do all of this work. And that sort of is the center of, of their experience while they're out at sea. Uh, June 26, the Enterprise arrives, arrives at Cape Francis. Uh, it's being blockaded by the British. Uh, because they're not a French vessel, they're allowed to go into port where they unload cargo uh, and repair the ship. Uh, and then about um, three weeks later, July 15th, uh, they leave with several vessels and a convoy back for America. 
uh, and they arrive in Alexandria August 11th, uh, 1803. Uh, for this voyage, we actually have um, uh, customs manifests made out for um, uh, for the enterprise. These live at the National Archives um, in Washington, D.C. And they tell us specifically, uh, item by item, what the enterprise is bringing back um, from the Caribbean with it. This is a level of detail that we don't have in the ship's log, um, but it's the kind of information that the United States Customs Service needed in order to figure out if the owners of the enterprise are paying the appropriate taxes uh, and duties on on this stuff. And so when you look at what's in the hold of the Enterprise, you see a lot of coffee, uh, you see um, things like boxes of sweet meats, uh, and then you see that they're bringing back with them 1,100 oranges um, from the Caribbean. Uh, these forms also tell us stuff like the owner at the time, um, where it's from. Um, I'm going to pause at this one real quick, because this one gives us an important piece of information for a minute, where it tells us the Enterprise is mounted with no guns, which is common for a merchant ship. Um, and then um, back in the early 90s, the one of the previous directors of Alexandria Archaeology undertook sort of a, um, a deliberate project to transcribe some of these customs records that are held at the National Archives in order to try to get an idea of of exactly the same kind of question we're trying to answer. What are these ships carrying? What's, what's commerce and mercantilism like here on the waterfront? And this is one of the, the customs records that um, her project got to. And, uh, we have this transcription uh, sitting in our office that summarizes very nicely what's written in cursive and hard to penetrate 19th century cursive. Uh, and um, uh, when the Enterprise gets back in port, this piece appears in the newspaper saying that the Enterprise is back uh, from Cape Francois. Uh, and it tells us that the Enterprise at the very bottom here brought out several French passengers, among which were three officers. Uh, and this is one of the things that on the customs form, if you look, it, it names them and it says they're bringing their trunks and their clothing and their beds. And again, best as I can tell, they're trying to get out of Haiti before, um, before the revolution turns um, bad for them. Uh, ship three, uh, ship three, voyage three is a lot like voyage one. They sail down to the Caribbean. Uh, they bounce around from island to island, checking in with ports, trying to figure out um, uh, what uh, what prices they can get for what they're bringing from Alexandria. Um, there's a couple things different. The first is um, something that happened even before they left port. Um, the first, uh, say, two weeks of the voyage, just about every day, um, there's a notation that one Mr. Grogan is sick. Uh, he's very sick. He's remaining sick. He's still sick. Uh, at one point, he goes on shore with the captain and is still sick. Um, and then the last entry that mentions him, Mr. Grogan, very sick on shore, captain on shore. And that's the last we hear of Mr. Grogan. And so it, it's not clear if he gets better and comes back on or if he gets sick and dies down in Norfolk. Uh, and then they they bury him in Norfolk and continue on with their voyage. Um, the reason this is important is because uh, about a week after they leave Alexandria, uh, there is an epidemic of yellow fever that's noticed in Alexandria. And so it's, it's hard to, to say for sure, but you know, reading between the lines again, Mr. Grogan here probably got sick with yellow fever, um, which after they left Alexandria took off and became a, a, an epidemic. Um, so September 6th, uh, about a week after the Enterprise leaves Alexandria, um, Alexandrians notice there's an epidemic of yellow fever. Um, you know, reading period descriptions of what yellow fever entailed, it's not a disease that you, you want to have. Um, a week and a half or two weeks afterwards, it becomes sort of a, an emergency on the level of um, you know, city councilmen have to take notice and uh, they have to do something, and you know, just like today, they're, they're trying to figure out what powers they have to try to stop the spread of this disease. Um, interestingly, right underneath of that piece that appeared in the newspaper about what they're doing to fight yellow fever, uh, as an archaeologist, this piece about, um, I guess, my predecessors trying to figure out what Egyptian hieroglyphics mean uh, appeared. And I sometimes you, know, you find just the, the weirdest things sitting in the newspapers um, directly in this case, directly below the pieces you're looking for. Um, and then again, if you look at the bottom of this piece directly above it, here's an update on the price of flour from Cape Francois, which 
if you remember, the Enterprise just came from and dropped off a whole ship of flour. Um, so the, uh, the Enterprise gets down um, uh, to a couple of these islands. Then on November 2nd, uh, news, I guess, of the, the epidemic in Alexandria catches up with it. And this entry here says, um, at eight o'clock, the doctor came on board, ordered us out of the port because the screen belonged to Alexandria, spelled with an E, uh, here in the center. Oops. Alexandria. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the, any port doesn't want disease and fever coming in. And so um, you know, there's an official task with making sure that ships from ports with known epidemics don't come in and land and, and spread their disease. Um, and so the ship enterprise, the schooner enterprise is kicked out of um, uh, St. John's Harbor. Uh, and so the other exciting thing that happened on this third voyage is this incident with the schooner Bonaparte. Um, as you read through the logbook, especially in the fourth voyage, they get boarded by military vessels quite frequently. You know, usually it's um, English frigates and man of wars, um, uh, a king's brig, an English frigate. Um, just checking up and making sure that you know they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not smugglers, they're not pirates, they're not secretly French uh, or Spanish or the English are variously at war with during this period. Um, but here they get boarded by the, uh, it says the prior schooner Bonaparte uh, up here. Um, and so this is the entry in the logbook. Uh, I'm gonna read the, the whole thing because the, they gloss over the best part. Uh, so first part, light winds and pleasant weather at two boarded by the prior schooner Bonaparte from Porto Rich. I think that means Puerto Rico is, is where they're from. Uh, it notes uh, they have two 16 pounders and two four pounders. Um, those are the cannon on board uh, and 60 men. Uh, at six took in the top gallant sail and main top sail and flying jib. Saw the land bearing west by north distance 25 miles. At two stood to the westward. At four hove round to the north and made sail. At six saw the land and then I can't quite read what it says there. Uh, later part pleasant at 8 p.m. came to, and I think it says anger, but it, it could say something else. And so this entire incident, they get boarded by the schooner Bonaparte with 60 men on board, gets just a couple words in this, this log book. Um, and it's not until the Enterprise uh, arrives in, in the port down in Barbados and then talks to some of the other captains down there. Uh, one of them, Captain McKenzie of the Betsy, and then the Betsy leaves and comes back and spreads some of the, the news and the rumors that they're talking about that the details of this incident with the, this, um, this French privateer is what it is, uh, make it back to Alexandria. And so this newspaper item that, that appears uh, not until December paints a much different story of this encounter. Uh, and so it's the second paragraph here, um, October 15th, this is the day after the, the entry in the logbook. Uh, the schooner enterprise of this port arrived there, there being Barbados. Um, the latter had been boarded by a French privateer who fired one shot for which he charged Captain Manning $20. The captain having no cash to answer this demand, they took all his poultry, et cetera, to that amount. And so there's a French privateer. And, uh, the difference between a privateer and just a pirate is that the French privateer basically has a letter uh, from the French government that says he's allowed to to board ships from the following nationalities that the French may or may not be at war with and, and take whatever he wants to. And so this French uh, captain approached the Enterprise, fired a shot, and then had the audacity to charge Captain Manning $20 for firing this shot. Uh, and then Captain Manning said, I don't have $20. And so uh, and instead, they just took all of, all of the chicken um, that, that Captain Manning had uh, to feed his crew, I guess. Uh, and then the, the item concludes with this other note um, that uh, a similar incident happened, um, uh, which I think, I, looking into it, I think it's the, um, the schooner Kitty, it doesn't say here, but the schooner Kitty with the Captain Bunker out of Baltimore, who also gets boarded by a French privateer uh, in the same gang. And they don't just take $20 of chicken, they take everything down to the anchors, the cables, and his sleeve buttons. Uh, and then when they get back to Alexandria, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, to wrap this up as quick as I can. They get back to Alexandria, they note in the logbook that they have to unload ballast. Um, and from the archeological sites, we find some of this ballast. Um, here's one of the Thunderbird archeologists, John Mullen, uh, holding a piece of non-indigenous coral um, recovered from what was then Alexandria Harbor. 
Uh, and then the last voyage of the Enterprise recorded in the logbook uh, can be seen here. This one's very different in that instead of going down to the Caribbean, they set out to, um, to Europe. They hit France, they hit Spain, then France, and then they go into London. Uh, and my best guess is that, you know, the uncertainty behind, uh, of the sort of the tail end of the Haitian Revolution uh, at this time, maybe coupled with that incident with the French privateer, the last trip down, they decided to try something different um, and, and visit uh, England. Uh, the logbook tells us that um, uh, William Manning is no longer the, um, the ship's captain, it's now Ebenezer Eveleth. Uh, who is named as the ship captain in that 1805 court case. And so what this tells us is that whatever happened to, to William Lewis that prompted him to sue the Schooner Enterprise and its owners, it happened on this trip because he names Ebenezer Eveleth, Ebenezer Eveleth as the captain of the Enterprise. Um, and so the voyage over to Europe, it's, very, it's fairly uneventful. It's a, it's a fairly long trip of, of not much happening. Uh, except they run into bad weather a lot in the North Atlantic and they have to pump the ship a lot. Um, they, they, they note it leaks a lot more on this trip for whatever reason uh, and coupled with the waves and the storms, um, they just pump. Um, eventually they make landfall in Spain, they sail up the coast. Uh, they meet another schooner enterprise. This one's spelled with a Z. Um, this one's out of Falmouth. Um, and eventually they make their way up to England. They note that they, um, they sail past Dover Castle, uh, pictured here. And in my mind, the age of castles and the age of you know, these tall ships are two very distinct historical periods. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, they're, they're probably only separated from each other almost as, as much as we are from, from this age that we're talking about, the early 19th century. And so it's, it sort of puts into perspective when things that you thought were so distant in time, they're actually, you know, they see Dover Castle. Um, there's an incident when they get to London, uh, there's a stabbing, uh, somebody gets clubbed with a knife, uh, the crew gets, uh, part of the crew gets um, imprisoned um, outside of London and the captain has to go on shore to free them. Um, and then they eventually get everybody back on board and um, they return back to Alexandria, October 22nd, 1804. You know, this trip to, to Europe takes the better part of eight or nine months. Um, and then the logbook ends after they get back to Alexandria. Um, to, to, to sort of put a bow on the story of our enterprise here, uh, it gets back to Alexandria, October 22nd. Uh, this appeared in the newspaper two days afterward and it says that the Enterprise is going to sail for Philadelphia in a couple of days. Uh, and then if you have anything you want to take to Philadelphia, you can approach Ebenezer Eveleth, who's on board uh, the Enterprise down at the Alexandria waterfront. Uh, we know that the Enterprise uh, gets to Philadelphia November 12th, a couple of weeks later. Uh, but if you look, it's not Ebenezer Eveleth who's the captain, it's William Lewis, who I guess, I guess gets a promotion. Uh, and then in, uh, a couple of weeks after that, they make it back down and they return back to to Alexandria, again, with uh, William Lewis as the, as the captain. Uh, the Schooner Enterprise, our Schooner Enterprise, shows up a couple more times. Um, here it is, uh, having been noted that it arrived in New York in May of 1805. Um, in June of 1805 is when the court case gets heard and settled. Um, and then, oops, and then court case, and then this happens. Uh, in July of 1805, uh, July 19th, the Schooner Enterprise gets captured or carried away by a French privateer uh, and is taken to a port in Cuba and sold. And that's, that's the last uh, we, we hear from the Enterprise. Um, I don't have records from, from the Spanish port or from the French privateer. And you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets renamed L Enterprise and it's still sailing around, but those records are... Um, uh, they don't, either they don't exist or they're in Spanish locked away in an archive that, that I, don't, I don't know where it is or have access to. Um, what I do have access to is about 50 years later, after all of these European wars sort of get settled, um, there's money set aside in some of the peace treaties to pay for uh, damages done to mercantile shipping. And so the process was, if you had a, a legitimate claim that you had a ship that was taken by a privateer flying under the flag of 
a half dozen countries. You could submit your evidence to the State Department and they would go through a checklist to see if you were entitled to any money. And that was what happened to the Enterprise. Uh, William Eaton of Alexandria, who owned the Enterprise at the time, and Robert Young, who was deceased but his estate, uh, filed a claim uh, in the amount of $12,220.76 for the vessel, cargo, and freight, plus interest from the time of the capture. Um, And there's a couple of notes saying that it was taken by a French privateer, taken to um, the sport in Cuba, uh, and then sold, and that's the end of it. from these records in the State Department, we learned that uh, William Eaton and Robert Young get nothing. Um, I think because um, the specifics of the case, who took it and when it was taken, um, fall outside of the terms of the treaty. Uh, and, and that's sort of the, um, the end of the schooner enterprise as, as far as, um, as we trace it here from Alexandria. If it's not chopped up for firewood, it goes on and um, becomes a French or a a Spanish or who knows, a Dutch commercial vessel that um, is much harder to to track. Sometimes in the customs records, you see a ship and it's noted that um, under its like, um, it's where and when built date, it says it's a prize taken uh, because they don't know or or, uh, uh, ship salvaged because they don't know when it was built. Uh, or where it was built, and they're doing the best they can to to best represent what the ship is and how they came into possession of it. And if that's the case for the Enterprise, somewhere out there in a customs record, there's a there's a notation that says um, you know, schooner, whatever they changed the name to, taken July 1805. And until I find that, that's the end of the Enterprise. Um, turning back to William William Lewis real quick, he's okay. Um, he gets back to Alexandria fairly quickly. Here he is again coming back into Alexandria on board the sloop Diana in mid October. Um, on the right is the thing that appeared in the newspaper, uh, sloop Diana, William Lewis. Uh, but right above that, the schooner Philip there, Marsteller and Young. Um, Young is our Robert Young, and so he's still sailing ships um, out of Alexandria um, for the rest of his um, career as a merchant. Um, Robert Young goes on and um, becomes uh, involved in a couple of financial ventures. One of them is the Bank of Ale- uh, Mer- the Mechanics Bank of Alexandria. Uh, and ultimately, that venture financially ruins him. Um, uh, but not before he builds this house down at the end of Duke Street that he moves into in 1820. Um, in order to pay his debts, he has to sell it to the bank just a year later in 1821. And then in 1828, the bank rents that house that Robert Young built with money he made from sailing ships like the Enterprise um, or the schooner Philip uh, on voyages, just like these four um, recorded in the logbook. Uh, and they rent this house to um, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, who would go on to become the country's two of the country's most notorious and infamous um, domestic slave traders. Uh, operating from this site, which would uh, become one of the largest sites of the domestic slave trade until it was liberated at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, they, they had a small fleet of ships uh, at one point or another, two of which, the Tribune and the Uncas, um, were also built on the Connecticut River just a couple miles from where the Schooner Enterprise was built you know, a generation later. And so there's these interesting um, uh, connections between our schooner enterprise and some of the other work that the Office of Historic Alexandria is, is currently doing in the city, um, in this case, um, on the domestic slave trade in, at 1315 Duke Street. Uh, so that concludes the, the logbook of the schooner enterprise. Um, I, hope, I hope this was informative and interesting and uh, gave you sort of an idea of how archaeologists dig something up from the ground that we don't know what it is. Um, learn something about it, and it's still somewhat anonymous to us, and then go and and do a little bit of research and try to piece together a a more detailed picture of what some of these things are, what they're doing, um, and what some of that context is. Um, So that concludes my talk. I think we still have um, just a minute or two uh, if there's any questions. Hi. uh, Hey, Dr. Ben, thank you so much. That was really good. Um, Everyone, thank you for joining us. 
We are, this is the end of the presentation. If you wanna hang around though, we will be answering some questions. We've got quite a few great questions in, in our chat. So if you wanna hang around, please do. Um, so Ben, we had a question from Frederick Abbey and he was curious about what type of wood was used in the construction of the ship and was it all the same type? He was, he, he posted this question when we were talking specifically, were you talking, showing the ship about the Hotel Indigo? So I don't know if you can talk about that or in general about the enterprise, either one. So um, as far as I know, these four ships, um, they're all built out of the sort of the structural pieces are all white oak. Um, the sacrificial planking might be something different. You know, it, it, it's supposed to be cheap. It's not supposed to be as hard or as durable. So um, I'd have to go back and check. It. Uh, it looks probably something softer or more available like a pine. Um, I have to admit that the wood species identification is beyond me. I don't know how they do it. I look at a piece of wood and it looks like a piece of wood to me. Um, but that's what they've told me. They're mostly white oak. Thank you. Um, on that same, uh, I guess, topic of wood, Jim Evans had a question about how is the sacrificial surface wood replaced during the life of the ship? So what would happen is um, probably a process very similar to careening. You'd pull into port, you'd have your uh, flanking there at, um, at the pier or the wharf, and you just and you can just pull it off um, and just you, you tack it back on. Um, and a lot of the, the sacrificial planking we've, we've recovered, you, if you look closely, you can see tiny little nails um, or where they've, they've furrowed it away, nail holes where they used to be. Uh, and so just a matter of, of you know, taking the ship, tilting it as far to one side as you can and, and sheathing it, and then tilting it to the other side and doing the other thing. Got it, thanks. I have to say that looks, that picture looked freaky. <laughs> Um, so John Sherry had a question. Do we know whether this ship had any encounters with pirates or privateers? So you did talk about that one privateer. Was there any other uh, time that you had seen that in the logbook? Or was that the only time that you guys were able to identify? Um, and then at the end. <laughs> off the top of my head, I don't think, I don't think, yeah, at the end. Um, I don't think there's any other, any other obvious encounters. Um, you know, they, they note in the log book, you know, saw sails at, you know, off the starboard at three o'clock. Uh, and so you know, maybe they did see privateers, but um, they're not explicitly called out. And Al Cox had a question is he had read in the past that ships would be burned to the waterline and then filled with rocks and sunk to make land. Did the excavations find any buried timbers or stones? that might, I guess, uh, prove that that was the case? Yes, that's a fantastic question. I came home after excavating, after working in, it must've been Robinson Terminal South Ship 2. And I walk in the front door and I was told to go back outside and change, to strip down because I smelled like a campfire. And, and I was, I looked at myself and I was covered in like head to toe and, and it was soot. Um, and if you look at some of the timbers, there's definitely charring on them. And so um, you know, one of the questions is, why is there charring on these ships? Why are they burned? Um, and I, you know, there's, a, there's, there's a line of investigation that I've sort of looked into and haven't come down one way or the other, trying to figure out where specifically these ships came from, you know, in the hope that they're not anonymous bottoms of ships, but we can name them. And so there's, there's one incident that happens during the Revolutionary War um, the former royal governor of Virginia is sort of sailing up and down the Chesapeake into the rivers with a, a ragtag group of sort of um, uh, plantations, plantation vessels, schooners and you know, small sloops and stuff with one or two naval vessels. Um, and they all get sick with dysentery. They don't have good water and everybody is dying. And so they decide to leave the Chesapeake, but not before burning between eight and 22 of their vessels down at the mouth of the Potomac. And so one of the questions is, are some of these ships, the remnants of those ships that we know were burned and dragged up here? And the answer is we have no idea, um, but it's a possibility that in the back of my head, um, you know, I've got a list of, I have a list of the fleet before it was burned. And there's a possibility that some of these ships are those ships on the list, but we don't know. 
So yes, uh, they were burned. A couple of them had stones sort of dropped on top of them, but not sort of, um, uh, not like large amounts of ballast. They seem more haphazard just on top of stones. Great. Al Cox uh, asked, did previous excavations on the waterfront such as Canal Center or Ford's Landing discover any ships? Yes, uh, I've lost track of how many ships we've encountered. So in the last, the last five or six years, we've dug up and recovered four, these four. Um, work at Windmill Hill Park encountered an early 20th century barge or two that um, is now underneath of where there's a pedestrian bridge that goes over um, uh, the inlet there. So we saw an early barge that's still on the ground there. Uh, farther down underneath, I think it's Forge Landing, um, there were six or seven that were encountered in the 80s. And to my knowledge, they were able to build on top of them, only driving a couple piles through here and there, but they're all documented in the site report we have online. Um, I'm trying to remember if, I don't think that that were any were found at the Canal Center. Um, I know in, there's a Civil War photograph of the canal that shows a small little like a bateau or a rowboat in the mouth of the canal, but I don't think we found any up there. Uh, canal Center, Fort Bending. So I, I've lost track of how many it is now. It's it's 11 or 14 that we've seen archaeologically under the city. Oh, and and uh, Battery Cove, um, the former site of um, the shipbuilding company. It's now the park down at Jones Point. That was all filled in in 1911 or 1912. And there's a couple of known ships that are under there as well. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I, I can't keep track. I need to make a list. So Lynn Jordan had a question about that. Um, does the city have revenue records from the time period these ships would have been added to the landfill? And she was wondering that the uh, seems that the owners might have either had to pay a fee to dump their loads or receive a payment for contributing to the landfill. Did it work that way? It. Um... That's actually a good question. Um, I know one of my colleagues, Tatiana uh, Nicolescu, has looked into this. And it turns out it's, depending on where you go along the East Coast, um, it's different. And so the way it worked here in Alexandria is that if you owned a piece of waterfront land, you could do whatever you want to with it. And so if you're a merchant and um, you've got a business on the waterfront, if you want to, um, to to build it out into the river, you can just do whatever you want to. It's not, there's no government. Um, you know, aside from somebody telling you that you're blocking nav navigation and commerce sort of at large, you can just fill in the river as much as you want to sort of out to the channel. Um, now, as far as records go, you know, again, this is sort of an ad hoc process that there is no sort of centralized uh, uh, control over. Every so often you see somebody in like the city council minutes petitioning city council for permission to sink a ship along the waterfront. Um, but those are few and far between, certainly much fewer than, than we know that there's ships under the, under the waterfront. Um, you know, sometimes in the, in the customs records that, that were meticulously kept, especially when the British were still in charge of keeping our customs records, um, you know, they'll note every ship that comes into Alexandria and then every ship that leaves Alexandria, and if you hold the two lists up next to each other, there's definitely ships that come into the, the South Potomac Customs District. They don't leave the South Potomac Customs District. And so, read, again, reading between the lines, they're here somewhere. If, if the customs official did his job right, it means they're still here somewhere buried under the, either under Alexandria or under Colchester or Dumfries. Okay. Um, I think I'll go with one more. We won't get through all of our questions, but Lynn also had another question that, do we know if the ship's captain is the one responsible for negotiating the best prices of goods in the islands, or do the Alexandria merchants hire an agent to sail on the ship and conduct the trading? The answer is sometimes. Um, and so sometimes the ship owner would tell the captain, this is what's on board. This is the price you need to sell it at at this port. And they would go and they would come back uh, doing exactly what the ship owner would say. Or other times the owner would, would entrust to the captain, this is what you've got. I trust you, do the best you can. Um, you know, come back you know, soon-ish um, and, and we'll settle the account when you get back. 
And so, you know, as they're sailing from port to port, it looks like the, the captain and um, Mr. Nichols in that case um, had a certain amount of latitude and, and um, freedom to, to decide for themselves where and when they're going to sell and, and what they're buying. Uh, but in other cases, we know that you know, there's instructions written to the captain that's to this place to do something such a thing. Great. Well, thank you so much. Emma, I'll hand it over to you to do the sign off. Thank you all for joining us tonight and adding so many great questions to the chat. Please consider becoming a member of the Friends of Alexandria Archaeology. Until then, we hope to see you all at some more archaeology events.